All right. So I guess we can go ahead and get started. Lord, thank you for your word, and uh, thank you for the opportunity for us to uh, learn more about you and to uh, grow closer together as a church. I pray you would guide our our time of study and help us to always lean into you when we're trying to understand your word. And uh, we love you, Lord. Amen. So we've looked at a lot of different things. Um, I know it was a lot of information. Don't get too discouraged. Um, as they say, Rome wasn't built in a day. So, uh, you know, just kind of focus on a little, little bit. You know, you just do a little Bible study. Just get more and more into uh, paying attention to the specifics. And once you kind of get into the rut of paying attention to the specifics, specifics of the Bible, you, you find that you will, uh, it comes a lot easier and na- more natural. You'll find yourself uh, going into a passage and saying, oh, I know this. And then you'll just kind of, in your head, you'll be like, oh, wait, no. I should still kind of slow down and take it in. And when you do that, you find that the Bible always has fresh stuff for us, always. It doesn't matter how well you know the Bible or how unwell, <laughs> how you don't know the Bible. It just doesn't matter. Uh, when you go to it to understand, God always opens doors and gives us uh, more knowledge. So uh, tonight we're going to look at the idea of kind of understanding meaning. And this is th- this might not seem important at first, but I hope you kind of get what I'm saying because especially nowadays we live in a culture that is very, um, truth is relative. And so you take those kinds of ideas to the Bible and you just kind of end up on a whole different uh, thing. So who decides the meaning of the Bible? Is it we decided by, oh, this is what it means to me? Or is it something that it has a meaning and this is how it applies to me? Because you hear people say this all the time. Well, this is what the this is just what it means to me. It's like, well, that's not really what that passage means, though. But it's what it means to me, you know. And it's fine to apply it to your life, but when you start kind of twisting what it's saying and kind of walking away with a message that didn't really tell us, <laughs> that's when it gets to be a little bit dangerous. So, excuse me. The, there's a movie. I'm sure you guys remember it. Dorothy of Oz, right? With her with her Ruby slippers. Everybody knows that. Well, in the original, it wasn't ruby slippers. It was silver slippers. And this is important because it's more or less a, um, I forget what it's called, uh, satire. That's what it's called. It's called a satire. Uh, because the whole movie, there, and you have to remember, at that time in history, there was a big debate. Gold or silver, where do we invest? Where is the future in uh, economics? Is it through gold or is it through silver? Back and forth. Well, the whole book... She's chasing the yellow brick ro- road, and it leads to a wizard who is not really a wizard. <laughs> it's just all flash in the you know flash in the pan, as I would say. And uh, then it turns out that to get home, she has to click her silver shoes. So it's like this political satire the whole time between silver or gold and silver wins. <laughs> and uh, so the, the idea being, well, who d- who decided what Dorothy Vaz meant? Is it us who watch it? And we say, oh, it's just a fun movie or book about a little girl going to magical world. Or is it whatever the author intended? And it gets to be a little bit confusing sometimes because people can go to the same thing and say, oh, that was an interesting movie. And another person can go to that same movie and say, hmm, a uh, great example. The movie Barbie that just came out, right? So I have a lot of people that I know that have gone and seen it, and they say, oh, it's garbage. Then I have other people who've gone and seen it, and they say, it's actually a movie against fe- radical feminism. And I'm like, okay. So they both go to the same movie and see two drastically different uh, main points. So what was the point of the movie? Uh, there was a, a new movie that came out. It was called Prey. Uh, if you get into the Predator science fiction movies, it was the most recent Predator movie. It was called Prey. And I saw it as the main character was flawed, and she, it, it causes the, the destruction of her tribe, basically. Uh, my brother saw the exact same movie, and he's like, oh, it's just a woke movie. And so I, I, we obviously go to the same movie and see something very different. And so who decides the meaning? Is it truly whatever it means to me, or is there a correct way to understand it? So is there a correct way to understand the Bible, or is it simply whatever it means to me? And a lot of people do their, do their Bible studies a lot like this. They'll go to it, they'll read something just for the day, they'll open it what, forever, and God will guide me in in my study, and they'll just read like a paragraph or something, and they'll be like, okay, this is what God has for me, and this is what it means to me, and they'll just kind of take it at face value and never go any further than that. 
And I would argue that this is actually pretty harmful, and I'll tell you why in a second. So a, a bigger question that our culture is kind of caught up on is, is meaning even knowable? And this is something that uh, if you talk a lot with atheists and agnostics and, and a lot of the younger generation, you, you kind of see this coming over and over again. Uh, but I think that an example kind of clarifies whether meaning does exist. You get a love letter, right? You read the love letter, and as you're reading it, you are concerned about one thing. What is this person saying to me, right? You don't care <laughs> what it could mean to somebody else. <laughs> you don't care about that. You don't care about what somebody else wrote to somebody else's love letter. You care in your love letter to you, what are they trying to say to me? What information are they trying to get? And you'll read it over and over again. Well, think about, pretend with me that you, you find a love letter. It's not written to you. You just go and find a love letter. You're walking in the woods and you find a love letter. And you're reading it and, oh, wow, this is interesting. But it's not really what it has to do with me. It has to do with more of what can I get out of it, you know, because... It wasn't written to me. I just found this random person's uh, letter. And I think that that kind of summarizes the, the, the debate with the Bible, too. Um, is the Bible simply an interesting book, or is it a communication from God? Because we can say it's the infallible, inerrant word of God, but then do we actually put that into practice? Um, so just to kind of further the, the point that I'm making, the Beatles had this song. I think it was the Beatles. I want to say it was the Beatles. It was called with a little help from my friends. You guys remember that song? Okay. So throughout the song, it sounds it sounds like he's just got some good friends. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, it's drugs. A little help from my friends. The friends are drugs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you pay attention to him and, uh, you know, the context of the song, the historical setting <laughs> of that, it's drugs. Like, it's obvious. And uh, Or remember that song, Afternoon Delight, right? It sounded like such a, a simple and easy, naive song. And they actually pay attention to the words, and it gets kind of awkward really fast. And uh, so what do, the, what do all these things mean? Uh, when, I, when I drive, I do the, me and my dad both do this. If the speed sign says 70 miles an hour, it means to say 75 miles an hour. It's just, you know, it's a God-given talent. It, it was just born with it, you know, and I'm able to just quickly, you know. But here's the thing. Uh, police officers do not agree with me. So <laughs> there's that. Uh, they would say that the meaning is definite. That's the way it is. Uh, stop definitely means uh, make sure no one is there and then just keep rolling through. No, stop means you stop the vehicle and then you go. Uh, if you get an electric bill for $111, you can't say, oh, it's my truth, you know. So my truth is that I only owe $20. <laughs> That's not going to fly for the electric company. And so that takes us to the idea here that I'm building towards. If the Bible is God's word, we must understand what he was communicating. The meaning is based off of what he was trying to originally communicate to us. However... If it's just good literature, it's just a good book, well, then it really doesn't matter. It's just whatever it means to you. So when you go to the Bible, your view of the Bible is inherently going to come out. You are either going to say, okay, no, the Bible is God's word, therefore it needs to change me. I need to understand it. Or you're going to say, this is such an encouraging book. It means whatever I mean it to, want it to mean, whatever it means at the time. It's something that changes and adapts for you know, this situation. It's not something that's uh, God's word. It's more of something that's just, it, it, it's got good things to it. And that, that always comes out. Um, I'm reminded there's a cult called, um, I think it's called Christian Science, if I remember correctly. And the founder of it, her name was Mary, Mary Baker Eddy, I think. And she taught in Christian Science that you, basically the physical world was not real. Reality was as you believed. So she ended up getting cancer. It was very painful. She had a long, slow death. But she still taught this this lesson that, no, uh, I don't really have the cancer. I'm denying the reality of it. And that's just silly. If I get cancer, truth is not how I feel. Truth is not how I feel. It's not, it's not, it's not what I want. It, it's what is fact. Truth is what is fact. 
if we want people to listen to us and we're talking, and we want people to believe us when we talk, that is based on the idea that there is truth out there and that it is decided by what meaning was intended. Otherwise, you hear people, especially the younger generation does this all the time, they really get caught up on this. Okay, so I... Truth is whatever I want it to be. Truth is relative to me. I make my own truth, right? Okay. So that means that when I'm talking, my words don't mean what I mean them to mean. They mean whatever you want them to mean. So I can say, I stand with the police, and you can say, mm, I substitute that with, I hate the police. See, because ultimately the whole idea of communication. Uh, but the problem is <laughs> we, live in a, we live in a culture that is very much so um, unfirm. Is that the right word? Infirm. Uh, and you see this a lot in cults, and this is why I'm making such a big deal about it, because there's a lot of newer translations that are doing this exact same practice, like the Passion Translation, where they're trying to take the Bible and trying to um, you know, substitute their own truth with it. Cults always do this. They redefine words. They'll say the, say the exact same thing. They'll talk about salvation. But they don't mean, I am a sinner, God died in my place. What they mean to say is by salvation is, I have come into enlightenment. Same word. Completely different meaning. Um, they deny absolute truth from a higher power. It's just, it's not, it's, it's I have reached a new level of, of, of knowledge. And uh, so then these kinds of people go to the Bible and they come up with these crazy things. How are you going to know when they talk to you about these crazy things and they use the Bible, how are you going to know that it's true or false? How are you going to be able to combat it? Well, with these kinds of things, you, you are learning how to study the Bible for yourself, but that's not the ends in and of themselves. You're learning how to, how, to, how to interpret it for yourself so that you can apply it, but also so that you can interact with others with it. It's a process, and it starts with paying attention to what it says. So meaning and communication is what was intended, not what was received. What was intended. Okay. So a, a good example of this is you're married, and <laughs> you say something, your spouse takes it to mean something else. <laughs> Oh, the jokes I could tell. And uh, I'm not, though. I've really matured as a person over the past couple hours. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so, you know, they, they take it to mean this. Well, what was actually meant? The, com the communication that was intended, not what was received. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 13. I wrote to you in a letter. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians or to the church at Corinth. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world. And I'm, I cut out quite a bit of this. But basically, let me summarize. He wrote a letter before 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is actually 2 Corinthians. <laughs> Confusing, huh? 3 Corinthians is actually 4 Corinthians. It's this whole thing. <laughs> but long story short, um, so he writes this letter, and they misunderstand it. They think it means, hey, we need to be like monks, separate ourselves from the culture. And so then he writes this and says, I didn't mean that. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister and is sexually immoral. Somebody who claims to be a Christian, but they're not living it. So that right here, we see what Paul, in Paul's own words the idea that meaning is, 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 is from what was intended, not from what was received. Uh, there was an African evangelist who came... Uh, to the U.S. and he was doing doing a little tour there, and uh, he was in Tennessee, <laughs> and this <laughs> this is kind of funny, and uh, he obviously English was not his first language, <laughs> so he was commenting on how nice the, the 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 moon's glimmer was, so he assumed sunshine moonshine, so he said your moonshine is very good here in Tennessee. Now people in Tennessee have a different idea for what moonshine is <laughs> than what he coming from Africa thought. <coughs> but obviously everybody knows that what he was trying to say. So it, it doesn't, it's not what does it mean to you, it's what does it mean and how do you apply it. Okay? It, the Bible isn't about what does it mean to you, it's what does it mean, how does it apply to me? Two, two different questions. It cannot start with what does it mean to me, or, 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 or what does it mean to me, because the, you are not the basis of knowledge. You are the application. If meaning comes from you, 
then get this, okay? You are only ever going to learn what you can invent in your own mind. We live in a New Age culture, a New Age society. People are combining Christianity with New Age practices and beliefs and all kinds of stuff like that. And one thing that you see with those kinds of teachings is that they always go back to this thing, I reach my enlightenment. Like Jesus wasn't really God who became fully human. He was an enlightened being like a Buddha. And a lot of it's, it's in a lot of Christian literature. It's in a lot of churches. It's one of those things you really got to address in today's world. If meaning comes from you, then you will only learn what you can invent in your own mind. So what is the Bible? Is there proof? And uh, th this is really what we're trying to get what we're trying to get at. And uh, before I move on to the levels of meaning that are very important, because remember, I'm going to say some things in this lesson that you're probably not going to like. The reason why I said all that stuff that I just said was so that we can go into that other stuff, okay? So I uh, also want to point out that authors didn't always fully understand what they wrote. Okay, like the Old Testament prophets, just because they gave a prophecy didn't mean that they fully understood what that prophecy would mean. Does that make sense? And we'll just probably come back later. So that takes us to the levels of meaning. A lot of people, when they go to the Bible, they always want to look for these like levels of um, of meanings that are underneath. You know what I mean? Like they want to find a deeper, hidden truth. And uh, so they go to great lengths to to pull stuff out. And we'll look at some of the stuff. And but before I get there, there, there are some things in the Bible that are kind of. Uh, levels to the Bible, and I want to clarify what those are before I say what they are not. So the first one is called foreshadowing or typology. It's called either or. Uh, that's basically something that points to a greater fulfillment, or it can also be something that serves an example for something else. So like David, as a righteous king, foreshadowed Jesus as the righteous king. Moses, as a prophet, foreshadowed Jesus as being the prophet. That kind of makes sense. The position of high priest foreshadows the need for a high priest, Jesus. The priest Melchizedek in Genesis foreshadows Jesus as the priest of a new order above the Levites. That kind of stuff, it's, 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 you can call it either or if you read books. It's going to be called either in those books, foreshadowing or typology. It seems like more modern books are going to call it typology and older books like written before the 90s are going to call it foreshadowing. But it's the same idea. Uh, so when David says in the book of Psalms, my God, my God, why have you why have you forsaken me? First off, this is serving as a type or foreshadowing of Christ. Obviously, he's talking about he is going through a trial. That's its immediate context, but it also has prophetic quality to it in pointing forward to the Christ who would suffer for something he didn't do, which Jesus himself draws attention to this passage. Um, prophecy often has multiple fulfillments or layers. We'll talk about this in probably a week. Probably we'll talk about it next week. Kind of like a mountain range, how there's like different, um, different like peaks to the mountain range. You're kind of at different distances. That's not how biblical prophecy works. Just because they there was this one prophecy doesn't mean that it doesn't. It only has one fulfillment. And it can have multiple things. A great example of this, the book of Daniel, it talks about the kings of the north and the south. This is directly talking about Alexander the Great came, came through. He conquered the world, the known world. And then he died, and his kingdom was separated between his generals. And there were two generals, basically, I'm, I'm kind of making it really simple here, that ruled over the land of Canaan. There was a king in the north and the king of the south. And the book of Daniel really accurately describes what happens between those battles before the Romans can get there. So this is something that's going to happen like in the coming hundreds of years, and Daniel accurately records it. Does that mean that there's not going to be, in the future, another king of the north and the south? No, there probably will be, but that'll be a whole different battle with the Battle of Megiddo and all that stuff, okay? So that's a whole different setting, but the same prophecy, and that's kind of what I'm talking about. So there are layers in that kind of sense from prophecy, uh, poetry often has multiple understandings too. But, and here's the thing I want you to get from this, meanings are governed by context. All meanings are governed by the context. If it's not in this part here, don't jerk something out of context <laughs> to get your point across. That's, that's, we are going to the Bible to understand it. Um, 
And, and the, the question becomes, you always have to ask, did the biblical author or the New Testament uh, author, whoever, because sometimes the New Testament will quote the Old Testament, did the original author uh, identify a meaning? Were they pointing towards something, or am I just making it up? You see, people do, do this with the book of Revelation all the time. I have no idea what this means, so I'm just going to make something up. I mean, they do it all the time. And if you read and watch all the different people in the book of Revelation, they all have ideas of, this is for sure the method, and this is for sure what it means. And <laughs> yeah, if it wasn't meant for that, it's probably not what it means. Um, a great example of this is there's some people who see uh, America in some of the Old Testament prophecies. But here's the thing. You've got to go to that Old Testament prophet, prophecy, and you've got to say, what did this symbolism mean to them then? Because I can't just say, hey, this is very similar to something that I have and I know from my modern symbolisms. Therefore, this is talking about this modern situation. We're 2,000 years later, in some cases longer, guys. Like you, you, You're missing a step. First, you've got to say, what did it mean to them? Remember the four-step process. What did it mean to them there before I can say, hey, how does it apply to me here? And all the passages that supposedly talk about the America and the end times, I've investigated all of them, and I've never found a connection with America. I have never found it. it. I'm more than willing to look at a new passage, and I would love to would love to search with you, but I really have never found it. And America is just not in uh, biblical prophecy. Uh, it's just not there. Uh, but it, it is there if you if you ignore what it meant then and there. Then you can put it in there, but otherwise it's just not there. So the danger it becomes seeing things that aren't there but could be there. It's not there, but it could be there. And I mentioned this a couple weeks ago about this is how a lot of modern Christian uh, books go. They, they, they mention something from the Bible and say, well, it could be like this. Th- this, this could be talking about this, th- this, um, this situation with Ukraine. Yeah, it could be, but it's not, though. Like it, Some aspects apply, but it, it's not. And uh, there's entire books that are, are focused just on taking something obscure in the Bible and building a whole theology off of it, like a whole thing. Uh, I know one guy who he was talking about the way that it says how we will be like the angels in heaven, and he built a whole theology about how people, when they die, become angels. And his whole thing was, well, yeah, it says we'll be like them. Not them, though. Like them. Similar in, like them. We would not, not become as them. There's different concept there. Luke 18 says this, or 15, I'm sorry, says, Or what woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp? Sweep the house and search carefully. In the same way there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. So see, right here is a good example. Jesus himself gives the conclusion to the parable at the end. In the same way there is joy in the presence of God, and so on and so forth. So he clarifies what he's talking about, what the moral of it is. But what some people do is they go to passages like this and they say, well, what is the lamp? What do the ten coins stand for? Who are the friends or the neighbors? Eh? That's a good one. What is the house? What does it represent? Or they do something like this. Well, when I clean, I get dirty. So she probably was wearing a dress, so uh, maybe her dress got dirty looking for the coin. And so the point is that as you're searching for God's will, you're going to get dirty. No, no. It, no, it says right here what the point of it is. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. So that's the point of the story. Like, you don't have to invent something. It says right there. And uh, so always pay attention to the context. Original meaning comes first. In every single situation, original meaning comes first. If your interpretation is arbitrary, if you just kind of whatever, it's wrong. It, that's just how it is. It's wrong. So when you're looking at passages like like Luke uh, 15, 8 through 10, what we were just looking at, ask these kinds of questions. What is the context of this parable? What is he saying in the verses before and after? That, that's the context, okay? What is this chapter of Luke even trying to get at? What's the main idea here? Okay, now after I've asked that, l- let's ask another question. What is the meaning in this parable itself? Not what does it mean to me, what is the meaning that it is trying to get across? The house that the, the, the woman cleans, it doesn't represent anything at all. It, it doesn't represent something. 
The lamp doesn't represent anything. It's just a setting for the story. She, he, the point is this. She's looking very carefully for a coin. That's, that's the point. Like, that's it. The, the coin is very precious to her. He's just giving details to help draw his audience in. She lights a, she lights a lamp. She's searching frantically. You know, you got you real uh, expressive language being used. She's sweeping. She's doing everything possible. Haven't you ever seen a woman who lost something go through the house in like a deep clean mode trying to find it? I've seen it. I've seen my wife do it. Get real frantic and start going room by room doing like this whole deep. She's got boxes packed by the doors, stuff that she's gone through. And it's like, what did I miss today at work? Like, <laughs> something happened. Are the kids alive? Are they well? Like, <laughs> what's the situation, Grace? Well, it turns out that she lost something. You see what I mean? It's the exact same idea here. And when he's telling the story, you can put yourself in that woman's position. Like, yeah, I would do the same thing. If I had lost that, yeah, I, I totally get it. And then he says, he, he gives the zinger in the same way. God's angels rejoice. So it's, it's like, oh, okay, so you're giving us the conclusion to the story already. And Jesus doesn't always do that, but it's important to pay attention to the context uh, because, you know, that's where the meaning is. And, and uh, so I mentioned this in one of the earlier lessons. I want to repeat it. We are not creating meaning. We are discovering meaning. When we read the Bible, we're not creating meaning, we're discovering meaning. Okay, You can make the Bible say anything if you ignore the context. Very important. So one of the biggest dangers that I see uh, whenever people are trying to find deeper meanings in the, truth, in the Bible instead of just studying it for what it is, is something called spiritualizing. And this is exactly what it sounds like. The search for a deep, hidden spiritual meaning to the Bible, something deeper than the common man gets. Uh... So, for instance, in Exodus, it describes the building of the tabernacle, right? We've got chapter after chapter describing how to build the tabernacle. And then we've got an interruption where this whole conflict happens. And then it goes back and it describes in perfect detail that they did what was described. So you could actually just probably take out half of the book of Exodus and say, and then they did that. But instead, it goes through painstaking detail describing that they did exactly as was described for them to do over here. Look, look through Exodus and, and look through, read them back to back and see how it gets almost boring to the point. And, and the idea here is that, look, it, building the tabernacle is too boring, so there has to be some other layer hidden in there. Okay? Maybe the, the um, things that they hang the curtains on, maybe that has a, has a deeper meaning. And, uh, you know, when you get these people get into all kinds of weird stuff about, Oh, well, the light color scheme. So blue makes me think of happy. So blue was used in the tabernacle to remind us of just how happy we are with our salvation. What? No. No, it's not, it doesn't mean that. It, it's where you're spiritualizing everything. You want to find something deeper. Um, and the outcome of spiritualizing is pretty much always the same. You substitute God's revelation for ours. And that is the big problem when we're searching for meaning in the Bible, is that we start substituting God's revelation for our revelation. It's not about what is God trying to teach me? How can I change? It's, this is what I want to believe, and God's word better agree with it. It better affirm what I already believe. And when we go to the Bible with that kind of a mindset, we're just setting ourselves up for disaster. And real close to spiritualizing is another... Uh, literary error, if you want to call it that, called allegor, allegorizing. <laughs> allegory? Uh, turning everything into an allegory. And an allegory is basically a story with symbolism. So th think of parables, right? A story that, that teaches a message. But with allegory, it goes a step further than parable. Every single thing in the story has a direct symbolic value. Every single thing. Um, so think of the story of Pilgrim's Progress. This is a great example of an allegory that was written to be an allegory. It's not meant to be historical. It's not written to be historical fiction. It's meant to be an allegory that teaches something. Um, there's a, a, a lot of things in the Bible that people try to turn into an allegory, but the thing about allegories is there actually aren't that many allegories in the Bible. There's a few, but they're very few and far between. Um, and the thing about allegories is they're really almost entirely based on your imagination, not on the Bible. It's more... Excuse me. My uh, lunch is just not really agreeing with me. I get kind of late. Um, the idea is 
that, you know, hey, it, it's, it's, I'm going to read the Bible, and whatever I can imagine this being a symbol for is whatever it's going to mean. See, it's all about my imagination. It's not about what is the Bible trying to say. And uh, so then, and the Bible definitely does use some allegory. Let's look at, for instance, Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. This is a great example of an allegory in the Bible. I will sing about the one I love, a song about my loved one's vineyard. Okay, so here we are entering into an allegory. He's not actually talking about a vineyard. The vineyard is a symbol. The one I love had a vineyard on a, on a, a very fertile hill. He broke up the soil, cleared it of stones, uh, and planted it with the finest vines. He built a tower in the middle of it and even dug out a wine press there. He expected it to yield good grapes, but it yielded worthless grapes. So now, residents of Jerusalem and men of Judah, please judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I did? Why, when I expected a yield of good grapes, did it yield worthless grapes? Now I will tell you what I am about to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will tear down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland. It will not be pruned or reeded. Thorns and briars will grow up. I will also give orders to the clouds that rain should not fall on it. Um, for the vineyard of the Lord of armies is the house of Israel. See, now he's clarifying. This is an allegory. This is what the allegory means. This is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah, the plant he delighted in. He expected justice, that would be the grapes, that would be the good grapes, but saw injustice, that would be the worthless grapes. He expected righteousness, that would be good grapes, but heard cries of despair, that would be the bad grapes. So right there, you have an, a, a great example of a biblical allegory. God starts talking and says, this is like a vineyard. Now, let me explain what, what, what the parable, what the allegory is here. This stands for this, this stands for this. He's very clear about the whole process. That is an accurate allegory. And it's written as an allegory. It's meant to be understood allegory. Um, and it talks right into it. But here's the thing. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of parts of the Bible that people have a hard time with, so they try to turn it into an allegory. Uh, I've already mentioned it once, but I'll mention it again. With the biggest example is Song of Solomon. We go to the Song of Solomon and we say, well, this book's awkward. So it has to be about uh, Christ and the church because otherwise it's awkward. But if we go to Song of Solomon for what it is, we can, we can know a few things. First off, what does it claim to be? It claims to be a love poem between this king and this woman. It claims that. Like when you're reading it, it says that, you know, about, about that. So, okay, there's that. Uh, it, it, when you, we can compare it to other ancient texts. This is a writing style of the ancient world. It is an ancient love poem. This is how it is written to be. It follows the same suit. There's no reason to assume that it's an allegory. There's no reason to believe that. The things in Song of Solomon are not symbols for something else. This is a man and a woman who are in love. That's the idea. We don't make love to God, obviously. And in, this, in Song of Solomon, the lovers do actually do that. So right there, that should be a big warning flag. You know, hey, this is not about the relationship between Jesus and the church. This, that's not what's going on here. But for some reason, some people still see it there. Uh, another issue, um, if this is a love poem between God and Jesus and the church, it conflicts with other parts of Scripture, and I don't want to get all into that. But the moral of the story is this. Song of Solomon shouldn't be discounted just because it makes us feel uncomfortable. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, a good example is uh, in the Song of Solomon, it says, uh, watch out for the little foxes, the little things that build up and cause mass destruction. That's how our marriages are today, too. And it goes beyond marriages, too. That's how church relationships are, too. Little things build up. Those little foxes get in there and start tearing stuff up. And it doesn't seem like a big deal, but, but as the lover says in Song of Solomon, take care about the little foxes. Be careful. They're getting in there tearing stuff up. You've got to be careful. In marriages, those little things tear the marriage apart. You start knitting each other. You've got to pay attention to those things. And uh, So, okay, the idea here, and uh, uh, whenever, whenever you're reading the Bible, there's a big red flag that I want you to watch out for, okay? This is the big red flag. Whenever you start with, what can I learn from this? It seems like a good idea, but the problem is you should be starting with, what did it mean to them? What did it mean to them? See, you are not the center of attention, and that's one of the biggest problems with, with, with modern Bible studies. It starts with, I'm the center of the attention. I'm the center of the world. It's not about Jesus. It's not about the original audience. It's about me. And I, <laughs> I need the Bible to talk to this situation.
situation. So I'm going to insert myself as, as the hero of the story, if you will. And that's a huge mistake. Uh, Genesis 2.22 says, Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And I have heard this turned into an allegory where it said something along the lines of this. Okay, so the man purchased a wife with his blood from his own rib. So there, it's, it's an allegory. It's about Jesus who purchased the church with his, with his body. Well, the problem is that there's nothing about the original intent in that. You completely miss what Genesis 2 is even about. The importance is completely lost. Um, one, of the, one of the big purposes of Genesis 2 is the place of women in the ancient, in the ancient context. So women were not really seen as partners in society. They were kind of seen as a little bit less. Um, obviously not, not as much in Israelite culture as in the world at large. But there was definitely the idea uh, in the ancient world that women were not really partners. But in Genesis, it constantly validates the woman over and over and over again. Like, for instance, in the ancient world, women were expected to leave their families behind and get married and, and kind of leave and cleave. But the Bible says, hey, men, you should leave your, family, your mother and father and cleave to your wife. So you, here we have, once again, the man having to do the same thing as the woman. And here in Genesis 2, the fact that they are partners. And then in the New Testament, we find out that they are also co-heirs with Christ. So here we have a lot of different validations that if removed from its historical setting, we can really make it say anything. <clears throat> Another important lesson from Genesis 2 is this was before sin entered the world. Man needed friendship, needed some sort of a relationship with other people. They, he needed that. This is not an effect of sin. From the very beginning, it was that way. God said, before man ever sinned, it's not good for man to be alone. That's a very important lesson. But if we start getting caught up in some other thing, it, it doesn't fit. It, it, we, we get lost. We get carried away. So not all of Scripture um, is, is, is secretly about Jesus or his sacrifice. Not all of Scripture is about Jesus or his sacrifice. Proverbs, for instance, is a book explaining to us how we should live life. <laughs> and if younger people would read it, they would find a lot less uh, troubles <laughs> to deal with. It saves them from making the same mistakes as, uh, as some other people do. I mean, it's, it's, that's what its purpose is. You know, uh, the book of, of Job, which deals with why do good people suffer? The whole book talks about it. I mean, these are big questions that people struggle with. And God gave us an entire book about that. You don't have to uh, try and, and, and say that every single part of the Bible is about Jesus some way or another. It's, it's not. I mean, yes, the predominant message of the Old Testament is salvation through Jesus. But, I mean, like, take, for instance, when you go to the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Did you know that not every single sacrifice points to Jesus? Not every single sacrifice was given for the sake of a sin. These are important things because we could learn from that, from what it's trying to say. So, uh, another, uh, we're doing a Hebrews study on, on Wednesday night, and so the question could be made, well, hold on. Doesn't Hebrews do this? Doesn't Hebrews go through the entire Old Testament and say this is about Jesus? No, no, no. The book of Hebrews compares. It doesn't allegorize. Okay? The, the Hebrews doesn't say, hey, there's this thing, that's a symbol for this thing. The book of Hebrews goes through the Old Testament, different things like the law and angels and priests and stuff, and, it's, and it compares it with Jesus. Uh, that's a whole different, uh, whole different uh, main point there. So, um, allegory basically says this always represents that. Um, I'm sure you've heard it said that sleeping in the New Testament is a symbol of falling away, right? So if you fall asleep in the New Testament, the stories, it's, it's a bad thing. Well, if you pay attention to Jesus' parable where he tells about the ten, the, the, the ten women with, with the lights, they all fall asleep. But five of them did the right thing, and five of them didn't do the right thing. See, falling asleep isn't a symbol of losing your salvation. This point of that story wasn't, was simply that one was prepared and one wasn't. That was the whole idea. And, uh, but with allegory, it's always this represents that. So in the, in the story in Judges where the woman is driving the, the head, I mean the, the peg through the guy's head, 
it, it, that has a greater, deeper meaning with this. No, it's a story of how there was a woman who killed a guy by driving a peg to his head. And that's, that's what it means. Um, and then that takes us to a whole level of speculation where, I mean, I've read a lot of bo- books that say something like this. Well, okay, so there were pegs in the tabernacle that held up the curtains. They probably also went into the ground. Uh, and so that means that it's like the symbol of Jesus going into the grave and then rising again. The Bible never says that those pegs went into the ground. Like if it was trying to make that allegory, don't you think they would have kind of clarified that? Like, hey, by the way, they would put this in the ground and then put it on the curtain. But it doesn't say that. And uh, so with allegory, you always kind of go in this kind of persnickety place of, of speculation. Um, and symbolism is in the Bible, um, just maybe not to the extent that a lot of people make it. Uh, symbolism is something the ancient audience understood to stand for something else. So like, for instance, in the prophet's, our relationship with God is like a marriage. That's would be would be a symbol. Um, in uh, the Book of Song of Solomon, she's uh, the the husband and the wife, or the, I, they might be lovers at that point, uh, are talking to one another, and she says, "I am a lily of the valley, a rose of Sharon." And this was a very common wildflower. What she's saying is, "I have no value." And then he comes back with this. He says. No, my love is like a lily among thorns. See, so she's saying about how I'm just, I'm nothing but a weed. And he comes back with, no, 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 no. you're a flower among the weeds. You know, and that's kind of the whole idea there is he's being romantic to her. And, you know, we've turned it into a whole song. He's the lily of the valley. No, <laughs> Jesus is not the lily of the valley. The lily of the valley is a, is a, is a weed, <laughs> Jesus isn't a weed, and besides that, it's not the it's not the guy in the story that that was a little. It's a woman who's a lily of the valley. It totally, totally throws off the whole meaning there, and uh, you know. But symbolism is in the Bible, just not, um, not as most people uh, kind of take it to be. <clears throat> so not all of the sacrifices of the Old Testament are allegorically Jesus. I mentioned that. Um, uh, a lot of times the New Testament, and pay attention to this, the New Testament offers a lot of commentary on the Old Testament. And it assumes that you have knowledge of the Old Testament. And the reason for that is because the Old Testament was the Bible of the New Testament church. They didn't have all the New Testament books that we have now. They had the Old Testament scriptures. That was their Bible. So when we go to the Bible, it's important not to just dismiss the Old Testament because it's old and stupid. No, it, that's, the, that's the foundation of the New Testament. You really have to understand the Old Testament. Don't throw it away. And the New Testament will offer commentary on the Old Testament. So like, for instance, how many times does Jesus say, if, you're, if, you're, if you practice homosexuality, you're going to hell? Not one single time. But the Old Testament already clarified that. And then Paul clarifies it again. But the Old Testament already said that. So he, Jesus didn't have to go through and revalidate every, every single thing that he already said in the Old Testament. See what I mean? It's one of those things where he already laid it out. Well, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, you're going to say, oh, Jesus was just a loving guy, and there was no condemnation, all this different stuff. Oh, yeah, except for when he said about people going to the eternal fire. <laughs> like, yeah, there, there was some condemnation there. Uh, when Jesus comes again, he's going to come in judgment and judge the world. Like, that's something that he's very clear on. Um, so... Uh, the New Testament definitely offers commentary on the Old Testament. Whenever you're reading the Old Testament, stop and say, does the New Testament say anything about this? Does the New Testament say anything about this? Like, so you'll be reading, and it'll say about uh, Zion, my holy, my holy place. So then you look over in the New Testament, and it says, okay, well, there's a new Jerusalem that's coming. Is it talking about that? Or is it talking about the way that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Pay attention to the context and see, because it, it could be. Um, so then a lot of people go to the Bible and they try to find these secret hidden codes. And this was real big in the 80s, but it is definitely still a thing today. Um, oh, man, I think Kabbalah still does something along that. And just all kinds of different crazy wacko stuff out there. And uh, so the idea is that there's hidden codes in the Bible. And these hidden codes usually involve some kind of numbers. So like maybe this word will stand for a certain number. And this one over here will stand for a number. And so then you add up the numbers, and like you do like this math, which who wants to combine Bible reading with math? Math is terrible. But anyways, uh, you know, uh, making, making the Bible boring with all this math and numbers and everything and, and all this secret meanings and all this, that's not what the Bible intended. Like, 
you, 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 can't, you can't do that. You have to say, what did it mean before? Because remember, the original books weren't all given at the same time. You have Genesis written in the 14 or 1500s B.C., and you have Jeremiah written in the 600, 600 B.C., so 500 and something in that range there. I mean, <laughs> these are written drastically different. They couldn't have possibly known about these um, computer programs and all that. Um, and the thing is, the, the world of today loves the occult and the cults. So a cult is a deviation like Jehovah's Witness. The occult are uh, more of demonic like um, the Ouija boards and that kind of stuff. And the occult and the cults both, they thrive on secret knowledge. They love to, to look for things that just might not even be there. And Christians have kind of gotten caught up in this mysticism too. It's one of those things we really got to be careful for because it's in a lot of the Christian books out there. Um, in the ancient world, like the time of Paul, they had the Gnostics uh, in the... Um, in the New Testament, they were kind of bothering the church. It was an early phase of it, but it was very much so there. Uh, and they always went on the secret knowledge about how salvation was through the men. One of their one of their things, I think this is from the Gospel of Thomas, which is not in our Bible. It talks about the way that women have to become men to be saved. Just like crazy stuff, crazy stuff. Uh, that's obviously, you know, clarified in the rest of Scripture. But, you know, one of those things. Um, and, and so in these programs, what you do is you, you put the Bible in a computer, and you remove all the spaces, and it runs a program through it, and it counts however many letters, and you get a secret message when you add them all together. And uh, th the thing is about this, have you guys ever seen the movie uh, 23? It's with Jim Carrey. You guys ever seen that, 23? Well, in the movie 23, Jim Carrey is like this. He, it starts out he's normal enough, but he starts seeing the number 23 in everything. And so he starts, like, freaking out. He's like, ah! It's everything's 23. And the thing is, if you look for it, you're going to find it. Like, it just, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Like, uh, and it's the same thing with all these Bible codes. Like, yeah, there's some of it, oh, that's really interesting. But it, you find it if you're looking for it. Uh, there was a woman back in college uh, who was talking to, my, uh, to my, one of my professors, and she said, I've started reading the Bible backwards, and I'm finding all kinds of new things that, that God is showing me. No, you're... <laughs> You're seeing a bunch of coincidences because you're reading something in a completely contrary way than it was written. It's not Japanese; it's English, and I don't know, but it's a translation. It's not Hebrew, so uh, there's just a lot of a lot of ideas there that just are, it, it's wrong on numerous levels. Um, and then there's a lot of people claiming a lot of things in books and, and mo videos, especially nowadays we have YouTube and Facebook video. And so people will get up there and they'll give themselves whatever title they want, like apostle so-and-so or rabbi so-and-so. And they'll say all these crazy off-the-wall stuff. And uh, yeah, some of it kind of sounds enticing. But here's the thing, if you're unsure, just ask. Like if, if, if somebody online is confusing you with these different teachings, Really be careful. Paul warned us about that 2,000 years ago. He says, for these people who are just getting caught up in these arguments that have no bearing on salvation, you're going to stay clear of that. But we still, 2,000 years later, think we know better than Paul. And uh, so we fall into that same error. So that takes us to what is the place of the role of the Holy Spirit in our Bible study. So when you're going through the steps, you've got these four steps, right? Then and there, what's the difference, what's the similarities in the principle, and how does it apply to me here and now? You're going through, these, through this, 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 this process. The, the interpretive journey is what we called it, right? And when you're going through it, sometimes you get to this, this conclusion. <sighs> so that's all the Bible study is. You just go through these, these stages, through the, the whole thing, and just... That kind of, sounds kind of boring. Well, the thing is, there's more to it than that. Um... A lot of people think that, the, think that the Holy Spirit is talking to them when they just have feelings about something. Not every time that you have a shiver down your spine is it the Holy Spirit. Not every time that something enticing enters your brain is it the Holy Spirit. I mean, imagine this. Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So that kind of seems to imply that his message would masquerade as a message of light too, doesn't it? So if that's the case, then we really got to be careful for it. But is this true? There's a lot of things that people claim, oh, this is a word from the Holy Spirit, and this is a message from God. Is it coherent with the Bible? Is it? That's a very important point. So the Holy Spirit um, works to illuminate as we work to study, our sh to, uh, to study to show ourselves approved. It's not the Holy Spirit does it or you do it. 
It's the Holy Spirit does it while you do it. Okay, just like exactly the same as pastoring a church. So am I leading from, from you know, what I think is best, or am I led by the Holy Spirit? Well, yes. I am leaning on the Holy Spirit, but I do also have to make choices, right? So, like, uh, it's similar to digging a hole. God, I want you to, to, to give me this hole, so he gives us a shovel. But, God, I want you to give me this hole. Well, he gave you the shovel, though. See what I mean? It's kind of like that. So, in, in Bible study, who's responsible for good Bible study? Well, you and the Holy Spirit. So, he's, he is going to do something, but he's going to do something when you do something. Does that kind of make sense? <laughs> he's kind of waiting for you to pick up the shovel, and he'll help you dig it, okay? So, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not more spiritual to go off half-cocked. And sometimes we do the exact same thing in our church services. Um, I'm not going to plan, plan the service because I don't want the Holy Spirit to be there. I mean, I'm sorry, because I want the Holy Spirit to be there. And if we plan out the service, he's not going to be there. So, are you saying that the Holy Spirit can only be there when people are disorganized? That doesn't seem to fit, does it? Especially since 1 Corinthians says that God is a God of order, not chaos. So that means that we could make our schedules for the services, but we could also make room for the Holy Spirit, huh? It doesn't have to be either or. We can be organized, but then also still say the Holy Spirit has the final rule, right? We can do that, right? And I, I think that that's a much healthier plan, especially in view of 1 Corinthians. Uh, and, and if you disagree with me on this, please just go through 1 Corinthians and kind of see what it has to say there. But um, <clears throat> So be flexible. Uh, can we understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit? Three answers. First answer is yes. We, we can understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. And this is at a cognitive level. Non-believers, people who do not believe in God, they can study the Bible yet not come to the truth. See what I mean? An atheist can read the Bible, read it in context, and understand what it meant to them then and there. Even make an application. But without following through on that application, it's just a cognitive uh, pursuit, a practice of the mind. That's it. So from that perspective, yes, you can, you, can, you can understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. Uh, second answer, yes, but only to a degree. And what I mean by that is sin binds us. And our lack of belief in God, that's, that's a mind view, a, a mindset that we take to, our, to, our, to the Bible. That, that's a pre-understanding we bring. And so when we have that pre-understanding, uh, it, it, it affects how we interpret the Bible. So, yes, but only to a degree, because the Bible involves more than just the mind. And then the third answer is no. Um, you cannot understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit, because um, it, it's basically saying it like this. You can understand, but you can't comprehend. There are some things that are hidden. It's like a veil being over your face. And um, it, it, you can't really penetrate to what God is saying without the Holy Spirit. So you, there's a lot of different answers to that question, but I think you kind of get the overarching uh, message there. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, But the person without the Spirit does not receive what comes from God's Spirit, because it is foolishness to him. So you can read the Bible without the Holy Spirit, but it's foolishness. And he's not able to understand it since it is um, evaluated spiritually. As you're reading it, there's a spiritual dialogue that's going on. Um, so it's not enough to just simply read the Bible if you want to grow. But you hear... Let me say it like this. Let me say that differently. So it's not enough to just read the Bible to grow. But when you read the Bible, you hear the... Um, you can hear the message, so that gives you the opportunity. It would be a similarity to me preaching to somebody. So I can give them the Bible... And that's not going to be enough. But it is, they can hear the message through the Bible, right? They can read it and read it in the Gospel of Matthew about Jesus. So that, but it won't be enough, but they can, it can, well, it's a starting point. And also the Holy Spirit works through that. So as somebody's reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit is, is working in them. Even if they're not a Christian, you know, the, the Holy Spirit can, can work in them. But the thing is, without the Holy Spirit, um, no argument is good enough. If you have ever gotten in a series of arguments with atheists, you will you absolutely know this. Um, 
without the Holy Spirit, no argument is ever good enough. You can have all the answers to all the questions. It still won't be good enough. I mean, go, don't believe me? Go on YouTube. Give good, um, well-worded, well-articulated arguments to every single thing. There will always be something else. It will never be good enough. And that takes us to the realm of the Holy Spirit. And here's, here's the thing that I want you to get. Okay, God won't work in some people. There are some people that God will not work on. Okay? A good example is Pharaoh in, in, in Exodus, right? So it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. So God's response was to har- harden Pharaoh's heart, heart. But it says before God ever hardened Pharaoh's heart, it says that he hardened his heart. And then God followed suit. And because he hardened his heart, he used it as an, ex- as an example to then build Israel's faith. The exact same thing is true of today. Um, he doesn't force people to believe. And if they harden their heart, a lot of times Christians will do this. They will come to the knowledge, but then they will abandon it and go their own way. And uh, they already know the message of salvation. You can't bring them back to it with, by repeating the message of salvation. It's not going to work. They already know it. They're just denying it. So there are some people that God is not going to work in, and uh, that's just one of those sad things, but it's true. So uh, the Holy Spirit um, being active in your life does not guarantee, it does not guarantee that you will have a correct Bible study. Just because the Holy Spirit is active in you does not mean that your Bible study will be correct. Think of it like this. A child has to put forth effort to walk even if the parents are there. They have to take the initiative and walk. And the same is true for us. We have to to understand. You have to use your brain and put it into practice. God doesn't do all the working for you. you know. Um, the Holy Spirit calls to mind the things that he shows you in the Bible. But that means you have to read the Bible. <laughs> you, you can't just, oh, well, the Holy Spirit will remind me. It's fine. You still have to prepare and show yourself approved. It's not either or. Um, and especially in Pentecostal churches, we get kind of really one-sided with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not give new revelation. Um, there are no additions to the Bible. There's no new message. Okay, The Bible is closed. There's not going to be new books of the Bible. God will give words of prophecy to the church, but those prophecies are subject to the Bible. Nobody can give a word that is contrary to what the Bible already said. You can't, you can't do that. This is one of the biggest problems that Muhammad had when he was writing the Quran. Because he said, okay, here is Jesus' revelation, but here is my revelation. I'm going to say, agree with that. Accept Jesus' revelation. Accept Moses' revelation. Mine is just the next step. And it's like, but you directly contradict those other revelations. So you really can't have your cake and eat it too. <clears throat> and the Holy Spirit, you know, is, he's not going to do that. And the Passion Translation, this is the problem with it, is the, the guy who wrote it, he has no qualifications. Then he goes to it and says, God took me to heaven and gave me these new secrets of these languages and no no like that's these are languages we know we know greek we know hebrew we know aramaic there there's no secret hidden thing i remember the the cult of mormonism does the exact same thing with oh i have these secret tablets that god gave me or the angels gave me and i looked to it nobody saw it except for me and my hat you know but I know what it says, and it's the secret hieroglyphs. And no, that, that language doesn't exist. Like, the language that he claims to have seen, it doesn't exist. So, um, but the Holy Spirit will help us understand. So he's not going to do the work for us, but he will help us understand. And we're going to stop right there. We'll, we'll finish talking about the Holy Spirit and applying it, and we'll start building, going into the New Testament uh, next week and kind of breaking it down there. Are there any questions? We are on the last couple weeks here, guys. we got uh, tonight's week four five and six, two more weeks, and we're done with this class. So if you have questions, Denny. So if I understand what you're saying correctly, you're saying, basically you're asking what's the carryover between what we do and what God does? Okay, so it's sometimes not really that easy to define. You're pr- putting forth an effort to follow, right? So like you're putting forth an effort not to not go back to alcohol, right? Right? Okay, well, the Holy Spirit is also working in you to give you strength to not go back to it. He's working in you to help you not want to go back to it. See what I mean? Whereas before, when you lived in sin, you more or less had to because you were a slave to sin. Now, you'd, if you decide to do it, it would be your choice. It wouldn't be the Holy Spirit made you do it or you know your flesh made you do it. It's 
your choice. See what I mean? Because you, you've been set free. Does that kind of make sense? So what that translates to is you are choosing to walk. The Holy Spirit is also helping you walk. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, so what you're describing is, so the Holy Spirit builds in, doesn't take away our free will. The Holy Spirit does not take away our free will. But the Holy Spirit builds in us a holy sorrow where when we decide to sin, we aren't at peace with it. See, back before we were saved, we weren't at peace with it, but we had a higher tolerance for it, I guess you could say. And, you, you know, we kind of lived in it, and as time went on, we got more and more dissatisfied. But now, it's not dissatisfaction the Holy Spirit gives us. It's like the sense of sorrow. And that comes to all believers because we are aware that we are betraying Christ who died for us. See what I mean? It's something that we can't, we can't go back to the same things we used to do before. It never gives us the same uh, pleasure. Does that kind of make sense? Does that kind of answer your question? Kind of? Okay. So, so any other questions? Okay. We're good? Okay, great. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Uh, help us apply it throughout the week and uh, keep reading it, to keep studying it, to keep getting closer and closer in it, and uh, to listen to all the things you uh, want to show us uh, in your word. And we just thank you for what a great opportunity we have as a church uh, to get to know you and to uh, um, allow the Holy Spirit to change us. We love you, Lord. Amen.